Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel de Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Abel de Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Able to On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. I'm on Tyler. And on, uh, before we get to our topic today, um, Happy New Year to everybody um, in Vermont and beyond. Uh, but, uh, before we get to our topic today, we would like to say uh, special thanks to our sponsors, uh, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and many, many, many others, including the partnerships of Einstein Hospital of the Bronx, uh, uh, the Kennedy Center of the Bronx, and uh, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx and many other partners and sponsors. Uh, we would like to welcome Daniel, uh, Daniel Poro, mental health advocate of the Bronx, to discuss uh, many things, including housing and people with uh, special needs. Welcome, Danny, to Able Den On Air. How are you? Larry, thank you so much for having me on. Happy New Year to you, your family and all your guests. Um, this has been uh, an incredible ride to make it to 2022. And um, again, thank you for having me on. Uh, these are challenging times. Okay, so explain a little bit um, on what you do in the mental health community as an advocate, and then we'll go from there. As a mental health advocate, I bring awareness to the elected officials, the community leaders, uh, the need of doing more to their constituents. Um, I have been a mental health advocate pretty much all my life, having getting treatment when I was a teenager in special ed classes from the early 70s. Um, Back then, I was heavily medicated while I was in school. But I used to run the Bronx Mental Health Council, which has no longer been active for the past 10 years. In the state of New York, every county is supposed to have a mental health council that to be active. And um, over the years, they just couldn't keep it going. So there lies a problem in communicating with um, community leaders, elected officials, directors of mental health programs, the state office of mental health, and at the city level, the office 
of um, it's called New York City Mental Health, um, the hygiene of mental health. So all those people used to come together at the committee level, county-wise. Um, I have seen over the years in these past two years with COVID, how um, so many people are now suffering more than ever before. This is on the mental health community side. I know for a fact that um, my advocacy still is very difficult because it's hard to help them when these mental health programs are not functioning uh, during this time of the year with COVID, a lot of the staff are working from their homes, they're answering phones, uh, a lot of them are, are just burnt out because they can't keep up anymore and they've fallen sick um, through a variety of contacts of people. Um, in my community, um, I also sit on the board of Bronx Community Board 9. I am the chair of the Social Service Committee, which I'm proud of, but it's the hardest thing to do during this time of the year because of services. And Lenders. why and why and why is it sorry for interrupting? Why why is it so hard? Uh, because you know, as we know during COVID. A lot of, when COVID first began, a lot of things were closed and people with special needs are stuck. So if, if services are, are closed, why, in, in your instance, in the Bronx, why is it hard to be on such a committee? It's um, trying to get the um, speakers from the perspective, city, government, agencies, nonprofit organizations to come and do a Zoom meeting is difficult enough due to scheduling and due to audio. Um, you know, they, it's, it's a problem that's not just rendered to the Bronx. Uh, I would say it's rendered across the city. But my problem is that the community is not engaged in these meetings because this information, which is public information, is not visible anywhere in the community for them to chime in. There's also the fact that people may not have access to the internet or not internet savvy. Okay, um, let my, I'm gonna let my wife, um... Arlene, did you want to ask? Uh, go ahead. You can start asking questions. Danny, what's the toughest challenge you ever faced as an advocate? Well, yeah, what is the toughest challenge you've faced now that we're getting into the meat because we're going to talk about housing, but what's the toughest, the toughest thing you faced as an advocate? The toughest challenges that I have faced as an advocate is communicating directly to the elected official on the need to be more aware and more spoken out on mental health issues. Um, roughly four years ago, a dear friend of mine got shot and killed by a police officer because she was having a mental health uh, episode at home when her neighbors called 911. And it's happened with her before. So the police department technically came, but they weren't properly trained to deal with a person who was having an episode. Here is a lady who's in her 60s, who's having mental health issues, who's shouting, according to them, probably running around the house um, with no clothes on. And um, they went into her apartment and they shot her. Um, that should have been handled more carefully with more training. And that did not bring any awareness to the local elected officials. To this day, they haven't done a mental health meeting in the community. Then those, then, yeah. those are challenges. Mm -hmm. Then New York should take uh, Vermont's example. example. What Vermont does 
Vermont has, especially Montpelier, Vermont, we, there's a team, there's a thing with the police department here. Montpelier Police has a, it's called Team 2. So Washington County Mental Health um, and a Montpelier, so a social worker who is trained goes with the police officer to handle such a thing. Crisis. A, a crisis. crisis. A crisis intervention on the list is called. Okay, so yes, certain states are doing it and certain states are not doing it because they're not trained enough to do it. That is the issue there. It's a constant training that EMS need to be, they go through this every single day, EMS, with people who are homeless in the streets. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the other people that come in is the police department who handle these calls on a daily basis. So if you're handling these calls through 911 system, you have several emergency entities that need to um, step up to the plate and understand that what they have been doing hasn't been enough. You don't kill someone knowing that they have history of mental health and these are repeated offenders in their system. You know, you just, you know, okay, so someone picks up a stick, a knife or something like that. Um, there has to be a way of talking to someone um, who's having an episode. Now getting to the issue of housing, which is an, which is an issue um, yeah. such as not being able to get adequate housing or or having housing and then um, the housing developments have so many open tickets such as the New York City Housing Authority. Um, e explain your situation. It doesn't have to be completely in detail. You can leave out whatever you want to leave out because of privacy. But... Um, Anything you want to talk about housing, the floor is yours. And what what we can do as a people to help or or fix the problem. Go ahead. So housing is a serious problem in our country. Here in New York City, we have what they call a lottery housing, which is technically um, just a list to get approved uh, for homes or buildings once they go up. It's, you get on the list, but it's really a joke. You really don't, we don't need a lottery housing list. Um, and then after that, you, you have to apply for these new buildings that when they make their presentation to the community boards, they say it's affordable, but it's affordable to people making uh, middle-class salaries, $55,000 is what they ask when you fill out the application. I don't qualify. I am in the poverty level. And when, it say, when they say it's affordable, it's not affordable to me. It's actually, um, it's, it's actually not affordable to a lot of people that live off government. You know, and um, you mean government, it. government such as uh, so food stamps and social in security. In New York City, people yeah. either make you know live you know people who are poor get funding from uh, HRA, Human Resources, uh, Medicaid, food mm -hmm. stamps. Uh, they get those services. I actually live off social security benefits. Um, my income is. Uh, a poverty income that's funded by the federal government. They keep me in a right. poverty state of condition, knowing that with the income that they give me monthly and annually, I don't qualify for these affordable housing. And there's no other program in the middle that will help me get into that apartment. I don't qualify for a housing voucher because they okay, say excuse, I, for people who don't know, I apologize. What is a housing voucher? Vouch, housing voucher is another government program that will help. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is that Section 8? It's, it's Section 8, 
it's it's a housing voucher, but there's clause in there. Um, like I said, I'm in a poverty uh, condition. I mean, I make $35,000 a year with my social security benefits. Now they say I make too much money from social security. I'm not entitled to a voucher. I'm not entitled to food stamps. And that's the only program that we receive in our home is WIC. And WIC is basically a program that is nutrition for my son who is four years old. Mm -hmm. so, so, WIC, so WIC is a, another program. What is that? That that's for like uh, baby food and well, it's it's a set of nutritional food hold based on, on his on. age, based mm -hmm. on his age. When he was a toddler, we were able to get formula, we were able to get cereal, we were able to get certain um, food that we covered. Mm -hmm. As he got older, you know, it changed. We we're able to get you know. Um, a dozen of eggs once a month, a, con a couple of containers of milk, juice, uh, 36 ounces of cereal, um, wheat, and, you know, there's a lot of wheat to go around. And my son is one of those children that he, he says, you know, too much is too much. You know, wheat, you know, bread, pasta, all of that, it's good. But that's what the government is forcing us. Cheese. Um, we need to have more fruits and vegetables. We, we need to eat healthier. Um, it helps because financially it helps my pocket. Um, but housing is a serious problem in New York City. Um, there's a shortage of housing. There are more people now in family shelters, in city shelters, in shelters for men and women. Um, domestic violence shelters. You have people in the streets more than ever before, not just in New York, but across the country. This is happening while our elected officials are getting these complaints from their constituents on a monthly basis, and they have not done anything, anything to address this problem. This is a mammoth issue that's ongoing for a long time um the, can, all right so um to piggyback on that go ahead did you want to ask us a question arlene yes um you know i know it has an effect on every community but go has, ahead go ahead has it had a how has the housing check your turn the housing, um, housing, um, how hard is it for a special needs person to get into a house, to, to any housing? Yeah, how, how difficult do they really make it for people with disabilities to get housing? Well, for people with disabilities, um, when you, when you file for an apartment, Hold on, hold on, try, hold, hold on. Try not to make so much noise, okay? Go ahead. When you file for an apartment, um, you know, it, it, it may say in the application if the person is disabled, mm -hmm. um, then that would mean that they would have to either, obviously, make accommodation or mm -hmm. have apartments that are considered here in New York 504. Um, and 504 is? 504 is the code for apartments for people with disabilities, whether you're in a wheelchair or whether you're blind, there are certain cr criteria that the apartment needs to have, grab bars in the bathroom, the sink in the kitchen and in the bathroom probably has to be lowered if you're in a wheelchair, um, you know, things of that nature. The stove might be a smaller stove or you might have to have um, some kind of hot plate um, so people can get around. Um, those accommodations, doors need to swing perhaps both ways. Um, so there's not enough of those um, apartments to go around in New York City 
for the for the volume of people now that live here with disabilities. Do you know do you know the uh, numbers? Because it all comes down to numbers and money. Do you know the amount of people that live in New York with a disability? Physical so, physical challenge? So I've been I've been haunting my elected officials on that question and you know, I haven't gotten any numbers from anyone, so it's difficult to say. In New York City, we have an office of the mayor, which is MOPD, the mayor's office for people with disabilities. And I would think that they would be the ones to have that, you know, on their radar. But, you know, they just changed the guard. We have a new mayor now, Eric Adams. We don't know who the next commissioner is going to be for that office. Um, the housing authority should have those numbers. Housing court for each of the boroughs would be a good place to start because they're the ones that actually see this um, in housing court, you know, um, people with disabilities are constantly struggling with services uh, for their can you Can you uh, explain now, New York, now, you know, like I said, I, I don't mean to sound off here, um, but New York City Housing Authority, now there's differences between rural housing, where my wife and I are, and New York City Housing Authority. Same same pot of money, just too many cheats, uh, spoiling or too many chefs spoiling the soup. Why is it that um, there has been, in your opinion, why has there been so many complaints around? In other words, if someone needs a repair in the New York City Housing Authority, a sink, painting, uh, uh, infestations, all kinds of issues. Why is it that it takes so many people so long to fix, or what they call that an open ticket, to fix something so simple? Um, In first terms of all, of that, yeah, go it's ahead. a good question. Um, I used to work for the New York City Housing Authority. It should not take that long if you have the manpower, if you have the crew, the maintenance crew. It should not take that long. Now, the problem is that because it becomes because it becomes a problem with people with disabilities when you're dealing with lead, when you're dealing with dust, when you're dealing with uh, infestations, because you. You can't breathe in roach and rat droppings, uh, you know, um, especially when you have little... No, no, you, heat, no hot water. Yeah, no hot water. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but <laughs> I know, sorry. Uh, it's just so much problems that housing is having when it, it should be something so simple um, to provide somebody... Because if you're paying rent, whatever whatever you rent you're paying, you know whether it be thirty percent of your income or if you're paying full rent, seven eight nine hundred dollars market rate, maybe more. Uh, fixing is something is an infestation of roaches or rats shouldn't okay. be a problem. Well, you know people live under these conditions every day in New York City for long periods of time. Okay, okay, let him speak, go ahead. One of the main problems that continues to go on is no heat, no hot water, rodents, mm. roaches, lead, asbestos, um, sometimes, um, you know, the it, like during the winter time, the boilers are not working. This is not a tenant problem. This is a manage, management problem. Mm -hmm. And management, you know, needs to actually be put on check by the building department. Um, other entities need to step in if the housing authority is not capable of keeping up with the maintenance 
of the building. Mm. It's not just throwing out the garbage, running the compactor, cleaning the elevators, but it's covering the holes, addressing the hot water, the heat, um, exterminating, getting the right people to come in to address the mold and the asbestos. This is done in a, in a choreographed way where you do the entire building by section, by section, by section. Buildings get old like you and me. Our arteries get clogged up with what we put in and every once in a while, you know, they need to be flushed out. And this is the problem. Maintenance, maintaining the buildings in working conditions, fixing the roof, doing the uh, bricks on the outside um, is an anomaly somehow that the city is so big, they just let it go. When you have a buildings department that come in because people call 311 and the problem is bigger than the call that comes in. The inspector, he's just there to do his task. The entire city needs to recognize that these buildings where people live are making them sick. Our medical doctors this in the, is the community- This is the issue with people with disabilities because they uh, can't uh, afford to be sicker. Yeah, but our own medical doctors from our community know that these buildings are in such bad shape. They have everybody getting sick, mm -hmm. asthmatic, um, they have breathing problems, they have conditions because of the cold, because of the draft in the apartment, because the windows are not winterized. Our medical community also keeps silent. So we have everything that's supposed to be going for us against us. There's nobody standing up collectively in addressing the problem in New York and in the country as a whole. We need housing to get the people that are in the streets out of the street and we need housing for the disabled, we need housing for people with mental illness, we need housing for do you need, do you, Does it have to be separated between mental health housing and uh, uh, disabled housing? Should there be a separation? There needs to be some kind of housing for people who have history of mental illness. Um, because in, in that environment, there might be a social worker, there might be a case worker, there might be, you know, maybe a, a small clinic in the building where you can come in if you're having an episode. These are the people that are trained to understand what the capabilities are to provide service to the people that live in their building with history of mental illness, substance abuse, you know, depression is a reality financial issues is a depression and then keeping us in a poverty state of mind is also uh, something that spirals people um, into uh, lashing out into society. So if these communities of housing are dis um, designed appropriately, uh, it definitely will make a big difference for people in, who are in wheelchairs, for people who are elderly that can't get around and there are certain buildings for them, clearly you would want a nurse, you would want some kind of social worker, you would want someone there in the building to check up on them to make sure that they take their medication, that they're okay, that they're mobile, that they were able to get out the house, keep their medical appointments. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you wanna ask any more questions? Go ahead. Uh, we're gonna approve security in 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 the night. Are they gonna approve security in how in New York City houses? Okay. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Hold on. Can you repeat the question slowly? Um. Will Will they improve the security in New York City housing? Okay. Will they improve the security in New York City housing? Because like security cameras. Um, and things like that. Do you, do you think, 
uh, it's not just New York City housing. It's housing across the board that needs better security because in terms of New York City housing, uh, the locks don't work. There's drug dealers that come in. Uh, and and this is a this is this can this can be a problem in, environmentally for people with disabilities too. This is a big problem. That's a go ahead. Go ahead. Wait. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. That's a good question. Um, and we this is, see it. This is your see, opinion. Your opinion. Uh -huh. No, this is not an opinion. This is a good question. Um, we see almost every day that security is a problem because it's not there. And we see it because the cameras that have been installed over the past couple of years have indicated that having cameras is a good thing, but also having a camera in the lobby of the building, in the elevator, and on the hallways without the presence of a security guard is a problem. And the level of crime that comes out of the neighborhood is now uh, the issue that we're talking about. There needs to be security, uh, security guard, uh, someone that will be at the front desk when you walk in, like a doorman. If you can have doormans in Manhattan for the rich, we can have not a doorman, but someone like a doorman, a security guard, what, um, what is a, I kind of forgot. What exactly is a doorman? Is a person that stands and opens the door? A doorman yeah, is basically someone that does that. He does a little bit more. He'll help people what with the packages that, that live in the building. He'll help people perhaps that are, are doing deliveries. Um, and also a doorman is a person who is in the lobby, you know, um, like pretty much like a security guard. If, if somebody comes into that building that doesn't need to be there, I'm pretty sure he's going to call the police department. And that's exactly what we now need um, in New York City and across the board. Because, mm -hmm. for example, Co-op City, a lot of the buildings in Co-op City, they have uh, from like 8 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then from 3 o'clock to 11 o'clock or something like that, they have somebody standing there uh, checking people in and out of the building and if you don't need to be there though you know that's because that's owned by river bay so i guess if a building is privatized they have better services is, is that your opinion as well like if it's a, it's it's again this is not an opinion mm -hmm. the more you provide security wise um the better for the people that live there, the better for the building, you know, less theft, less, less property damage. Um, those people in Co-op City that have that service, I'm pretty sure they will want that service around the clock. Mm -hmm. I have uh, public safety officers here in Parkchester, um, and there's not enough of them to go around. If I see something that's going on from my window and I call, it shouldn't take them half an hour to get to the call. Are they really that busy? And yet again, this is a small area. Now, let me give you another quick example. We have uh, cameras in the lobby of my building and they've been there for a long time. And I'm glad that they're there the number one problem that we all have here, everybody that lives here, is that we can't see on the television or on the laptop who's ringing our doorbell because they say um, that secure, that camera is, is, um, is for the purpose of public safety officers and monitoring them. That. I need to know who's ringing my bell. Mm -hmm. So we're not working together. We're actually working against um, collaborating. These are simple steps. Mm -hmm. So um, we we have twelve minutes left. So to 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 um, to prioritize your you know, and of course you don't have to mention a lot of stuff. You're having housing issues. 
the okay. your okay. your building is trying to get you out. Um, what's one thing that if your if if the Bronx can hear you, what's one thing that being an advocate that you want to see changed um, so, or or put a stop to? So let let me say this. Um, I've been in this apartment for thirty years, mm -hmm. and this is a co-op apartment. So we are under new management. The new management wants more than double the rent. Now, again, I live off government assistance by social security. I make a certain income and they're trying to evict us because we can't pay what they're asking for. Um, so they're taking us to housing court for an eviction. In the city of New York, in the borough of the Bronx, housing court and the government here does not have a program that will help me transition from my current apartment to an affordable apartment. They don't have that. What they're telling me is that due to COVID right now, um, we will handle this once we go back to housing court, that there's a good possibility that I will have to go into a family shelter with, uh, with my wife and, and my son, who's four years old. Family shelters are terrible. Um, they, don't, they don't provide the necessary securities that we talked about just moments ago. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in a family shelter, it's difficult to process the information because of the staff perhaps not being there. And the paperwork, um, it's all paperwork. You can do the paperwork, but there is no housing available for us. We have thousands and thousands of families in shelters and in the streets of New York. We need affordable housing for the people mm. who are being pushed down all due to rent increase. And yet our government who funds us has nothing in the middle to pick up the pieces on our behalf. Government is actually pushing us out of the out into the streets. Mm -hmm. These are the saddest moments that I have seen every month, every month, Larry, I see moving vehicles, watching people, my neighbors move out, all because they cannot pay the rent. Can, can you give me, can you give us, uh, can you give us a inkling to what, how, high the rent is in your establishment, in your area, and why people can't afford it? So, people who live on fixed incomes, the, the incomes don't go up as high as the cost of living. The incomes don't go up as much as market value. Market value is uh, an investment for banks, and um, companies and our government knows this, and yet our government doesn't intervene on behalf of the people that have no means of, of keeping up with the cost of living. Mm -hmm. So um, I saw on the news yesterday that the U-Haul companies have made a report that there are hundreds of thousands of people across America that are moving out of big cities like New York. There are numbers out there. Um, we're, we're being forced out. These are the saddest trails of tears that I mentioned because it's like what they did to the American Indian. We're, they're pushing us out of our own communities. Um, you have people with different salaries, people that are working, people who are actually working while COVID uh, are moving out because they can't keep up with the cost of living. Now, these are the middle class. There's no talk about people in poverty, people that are funded by the federal government. The federal government wants us 
in a poverty state condition mm -hmm. because they will be able to give us money like they've given money to everybody else. All these corporate companies are getting funded just to stay afloat. Okay. Um, Arlene, did you want to ask one last question before we end? Can people with disabilities afford to live in Mitchell Island? Um, yes, some people with disabilities, you know, which is a good thing, have different means of, of earning their income. Some, you know, people with disabilities work. Some are fortunate enough that they're able to, to, to stay afloat and to keep up with the cost of living. But you have others that can't keep up you know you have medical conditions you have other things that get in their way that prevent them from keeping up with the cost of living staying in their neighborhoods traveling left and right people with disabilities are having a hard time standing in the pantry for three hours just trying to get a couple of bags of food mm. and, and that's another issue um anything else you want to say before we end the one thing that's really, really important, Larry, this ought to be an eye-opening experience to all of us who live in this great country that our healthcare system is not where it needs to be to provide service to us in general. I shouldn't have to wait five months to see a medical doctor. That's one thing. Um, now, Helping people with mental illness is a problem. Addiction, suicide, our youth are the number one uh, problem that I see that they are not interacting like they should as children because they are isolated. They have to be at home. Um, they can't go out. They can't be comfortable in schools. They are the next problem of America in the future. And there's no way, there's, I don't see how the country is addressing the problem of our kids today. Mm. Well, we would like to thank um, Daniel Poro, uh, mental health advocate of the Bronx, for joining us on this edition of Able Then On Air. Thank you, Danny, for um, providing insight for those who need um, assistance in the mental health community. And thank you so much for uh, providing uh, insight on this uh, topic. Uh, for more information on any topic that you have seen uh, today on Ableton On Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. That's O R C A M E D I A dot net. And um, uh, uh, this puts an end to this edition of Ableton On Air. Thank you to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many other partners um, for this program. Um, this puts an end to this edition of April Dinner on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Arlene Seiler. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press, media editors, New York Parrot online newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, domestic and international, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rosef Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York. 
Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel de Nonair has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Abel de Nonair is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.